right, let's go ahead and get started this morning. It's good to be in church this morning. Let's go ahead and get our hymnals. We'll stand and sing hymn number 129 to start this morning. 129. And forty one, one hundred and forty one. Look, he saints the sight.
Brother Spurgeon, it's good to have you back in church, man. If I had a dollar for every time my, my, my kids are like, when are the Spurgeons getting back? When are the Spurgeons getting back, man? Come on, man. Would you pray for us this morning, brother? It'd be an honor. Appreciate it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Amen. And make payment for our sin. I sure Amen. wish it wouldn't have took that, yes. but it did. Yes. We were hopeless sinners. And Father God, I thank you that he didn't just die on the cross, but... After three days Amen. and doing what he did during them three yes. days, he rose from the grave. Yes. 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 Father God, every day a Christian wakes up, they ought to be mindful of that. But today we're especially mindful of it because this is a day where a lot of people that don't think much about God are thinking about Easter and thinking about their perception of whatever. But God, there's going to be people in churches like this all over America today that don't normally come. And I pray that today they hear the gospel. Yes. This church, Amen. other churches, God, I pray that some would come to the same knowledge Amen. of Amen. our Savior this day. Bless yes. our service here. Let me just concur. It is good to be home. Amen. I love Amen. you, Lord. Pray you get all, all the honor you deserve from our efforts today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And teens, we're going to stay down here this morning, Amen. obviously. Amen. All right. So is that, is that better? All right. Jerry, is that better? I'm glad you two finally got good. So Jerry is not, he is not going to take the show over with the new organ. Uh, I, I talked, <laughs> had a couple of people come up to the last week and said, it was really loud when it got louder Wednesday night. And uh, I'm like, man. So I didn't realize that the foot pedal on the organ actually is the, the volume control. So Jerry, and I had, uh, uh, Beth had a friend, Kathy Robertson, down in Florida, and she would talk to Beth, and Beth would talk to her, and, and she'd go, Bethy, Bethy, men are always brakes and gas, full gas and all brakes. There's no place in the middle for them. And I thought, as soon as, as soon as I heard that, I'm like, and I heard about the gas pedal, I'm like, that's Jerry. Right in the, there is no middle, man. It's either you can't hear me or it's going to be everything. And, uh, but uh, he's, it's a new toy, and he's playing with it, and he's, he's working out the bugs. And uh, so just bear with him for just a little while while he's figuring that thing out. And it'll be a blessing. We got the Andersons with us tonight. I've, I've seen, or today, uh, they're going, he's going to do Sunday school here in just a second. But um, I met him down in Florida when I went down there. It was a blessing. I went down to see Brother Donovan, and they were down there. And uh, his wife got up, and Miss Amy got up and sang. And, and uh, right then and there, I said, we're going to pick him up. I said, will you all come or not? We're going to pick you up. They, uh, I, it, just, it was something inside my heart. The Lord just said, hey, here's a good family, good solid. You, can, you tell something by people sometimes by the first impressions you get of them. And when I met him and, and his, his family, I said, this, this, I'm good with this. I said, we need a missionary in the, uh, you, or the Papua New Guinea. And I said, well, this is a good one. And, and uh, it's just, it was good to have him. So, brother, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll shut up right now. Otherwise, I'll take up some of your time. And just after the morning, uh, the, this, and then we go into morning service, we're going to have communion this morning early. And then I'll preach for a few minutes, and then we'll go to lunch. <laughs> All right, morning. Miamamaslong looking you, Pella. Thank you, Lakam. So I'm happy to see you. Thanks for coming. And uh, speaking in tongues, that probably actually sounded like charismatic tongues, but it is a real language. But uh, so we're we're thankful to be here. Um, just start with a little bit of a testimony um, before I get into the presentation of the field, and I should be done at what time? Sorry? Whenever. Whenever. Okay. Yeah. 11 o'clock. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, so just want to thank Pastor Elliot for giving us a chance to come and um, taking a chance off of a first impression, and uh, that's a hope by the grace of God we can live up to that on the field and in our service for the Lord in Papua New Guinea. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll talk more about my family here in a few minutes, uh, but just start with a little bit of a personal testimony. Uh, many of you, this would be the first time you've met me or met my family, um, but there are a handful of people here that know of us and know us, but just to try to introduce who we are to the church. And um, so my, my story, uh, my testimony is a testimony of uh, just, just an abundance of the grace of God. Um, I, I will start all the way back before I was born um, with my dad's testimony a little bit because it, it 
uh, gives more glory to what the Lord has done in my life. But my dad grew up um, an unsaved man, grew up in the Church of Christ, uh, which believes in baptismal regeneration, uh, spent his teenage years in the state of Texas, and uh, grew up into a life of uh, drug use. Uh, 16 years old, he was arrested uh, for, for drug possession and went to jail the first time at 16 years old. He holds one of the distinct honors of being one of the first students uh, arrested from, I think it was Abilene Christian College for illegal drug use. <laughs> um, and so that was my dad's life, uh, in and out of jail, in a lot of trouble, wound up joining the Navy from Texas. And by the grace of God, he got uh, stationed over in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, in the late 70s, he wound up in Pensacola, Florida in the Navy, uh, still lost and still in and out of trouble. And at one point, I forget the exact year, but in the late 70s, he wound up in the Escambia County Jail in Pensacola, Florida. And a preacher came and preached the gospel to him. And my dad got saved in that jail. Uh, he wound up getting out. He went to started attending a Southern Baptist church right close to our house. So I lived over on the west side of Pensacola uh, by the Navy base. And my dad started attending a little Southern Baptist church there. And uh, at that time, my mom made a profession of faith in the Lord. Um, later would say that she didn't really mean it, um, but she actually did later get saved later in life. Uh, but that explains a lot of the, I actually just heard my mom's full testimony last weekend. She got to come to the meeting we were at in Iowa and uh, heard her, her m more details of her testimony than I'd ever known. I, I always thought she was saved when I was a kid, and, but she just never had victory over alcohol. But matter of fact, she, she wasn't saved. I wound up getting saved when I was about 12 years old. God delivered her from alcohol. Um, so my, my mom kind of continued to live a troubled life there. Uh, but when uh, I was born, my parents were going to that little Southern Baptist church. They weren't growing much, um, but they were in church. And one day my dad, my dad worked at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, he was a computer programmer back when computers were the size of this, this area at the front of the church. Uh, we were just talking with Brother Elliot about that, you know. Probably that whole room was, what, 20, 20, no, what did you say? 56 bytes or? 56K per card. Yeah, so not much. Um, so I remember going there as a kid and seeing where my dad worked. But all that to say, one day my dad's at work and a man starts whistling a hymn in the office. And my dad heard that hymn. The, the guy was just trying to find someone else who was saved and another Christian. So my dad heard that and met this guy. This guy was actually going to Bible Baptist Church, and he was a Pensacola Bible Institute student at the time. Invited my dad to that church. So when I was six months old, my parents went to Bible Baptist Church for the first time. When I was nine months old, they became members there. Uh, my dad went to school there, graduated in 1986. All this, again, by the grace of God in my life, uh, you know, happened when I was very young. So by the time I was nine months old, I'm in a Bible-believing church. One of the best that there, that there is. And uh, grew up in that church, in the Sunday school ministry of that church, hearing the gospel every week. My dad was, um, had been in the Navy and always was very punctual. We were at church. We lived 30 minutes away from church, and we were always 30 minutes early to church. And so I was brought up. Church was very, uh, it was the, the central point of our life, and it was our focus. I, I grew up in public school, but church was always the focal point of our life, and I thank God for that. So at a very young age, knew the gospel, knew I was a sinner, knew I was on my way to hell. Uh, October 1986, I would have been four years old, and uh, my pastor at that time, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, many of you would know, used to draw while he preached, and I remember one night seeing a picture he drew of souls burning in hell, and uh, we got in my family's old yellow Ford Econoline van, uh, the, the independent Baptist vehicle of choice back in the day. And uh, so we, I got in that thing on the way home, and I was convicted, and I was scared, and I knew I was on my way to hell, and I knew that Jesus Christ had died for my sins, and I knew all I had to do is accept him as my Savior. And so I got 
get this. I know some of you modern, younger parents will have a heart attack here, but I got out of my seat while the van was moving and knelt down in the back at a bed my dad had built and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. I walked to the front of the van while the van was moving, and yes, I'm still alive somehow, uh, walked to the front of the van, told my dad what I just did, and of course, you know, my dad was family was rejoicing, so by the grace of God, I got saved at a young age, four years old. Um, by the time I was seven, my parents wound up divorcing, um, which again, by the grace of God, this is another long, long story um, of God's grace, but by the grace of God, through the counsel of my pastor, um, in the divorce, I have an older brother and two older sisters, and my sisters went with my mom, and my brother and I stayed with my dad. And that's one of the best things that could have happened to me. My mom, as I said, at that time was not saved, was certainly not living a, a good life, and uh, wound up really struggling with alcohol, and that took her way down in her life. Um, and so at that time, again, one of the things God did for me there, kept me in my dad's home. My dad stayed faithful to the Lord, read his Bible every day, prayed, witnessed, made us memorize scripture, we always had some type of ministry that we were involved in. And again, like I said, the focal point of our life was, was our church. And so I grew up in church. But also what that did is it allowed me to see the contrast where my, my, when I would go over to my mom's house on weekends, I would see the life that, you know, this world has to offer, that sin has to offer. I'd see the effects of it. I'd see the, the domestic violence and I'd see the, you know, just the trouble that comes out of drunkenness and revelings and such like. And I got exposed to that, but I would also go back to my dad's house and experience the peaceable fruit of righteousness in a home. And that was a really good thing for me to get to. Uh, at that time, I didn't even realize the value of that. So growing up in through the church ministry, um, I basically didn't realize what I had. I didn't realize how good I had it, didn't realize a lot of these good things that God had had and was doing for me. Um, and so as a teenager, I was not what you would call right with the Lord. I was not seeking the Lord. I wasn't walking in fellowship with the Lord. I knew I was saved from the, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, from the time I was four years old to this day, I know I'm saved. I've been shown from the scriptures, the, the facts that prove my salvation. And I know that I'm saved. I've never known what it's like to, to go through trouble and to go through something without the presence of the Lord in my life. Even when I was backslidden, which I did become backslidden in heart and trying to, even though I had seen the contrast, I was trying to go after this world. Um, but this is where, again, by the grace of God, God gave me a really good dad. Um, and my dad tried to obey the scriptures in obeying Proverbs 22, 6, training up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And my dad took that verse seriously. He had three friends that he would often rely on for assistance in the training up process. And their names were Randy the Rod, Peter the Paddle, and Bob the Belt. Some of the young people don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but that was, those were my dad's best friends. And, uh, you know, I'd get in trouble, and my dad would say, who's it going to be, Randy, Peter, or Bob? <laughs> um, maybe a little bit of, what is that, sadistic? No, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, I'm really thankful that I had a dad that disciplined me and spanked me and trained me in the way I should go. And what that did, because as I was a teenager, not trying to live for God, not trying to, to seek after the Lord, and, and, and trying actively to go away from God, what I had in my heart was a healthy fear of my dad. And while other friends got into things, um, there, were, there were things that I held back from because I was afraid not of God. I had, at that time, not a healthy fear of God, but a healthy fear of my dad. I knew my dad loved me. There was no abuse. There was no lack of love. But there was an authority. And that fear was in place, and it kept me out of a lot of trouble that I, that I should have got into. And I thank God for that. And so I, I grew up through the ministries of Bible Baptist Church uh, into my 15, 16 years old, just a rebellious mess, living under a, a guilty conscience 
I couldn't walk in church and look anybody in the eye. Um, all I wondered is, you know, what did they see me doing this week? Uh, I'd walk past Brother Donovan's office at the time. He was the associate pastor and had recently been the youth pastor. He wasn't necessarily the youth pastor then, but I, would, I often <laughs> would walk past the office and hear, Joey? Oh, my heart would sink. <laughs> and I'd think, oh boy, what am I in trouble for now? So to this day, when Brother Donovan calls me up, I still get, I still feel like, oh no, what did I do? I, I must have, <laughs> what did he find out? But I'm not living the same life now, but uh, anyway, so had that in my life, that experience, trying to run away from God, but God in his graciousness and goodness, putting some things in place to keep me out of more trouble, much more trouble um, that I deserve to get into. So growing up into the ministry, the summer camps of Bible Baptist Church, um, then in, in my life, Brother Peacock got involved. He would preach our youth camps, and if you've ever been to a pre Youth camp, Brother Peacock preaches. Uh, he doesn't go, well, I've heard today he does go easy on the young people. <laughs> You're like, no, he doesn't. Um, <clears throat> back in the day, he didn't. Uh, but no, I'm really thankful God, God let him, his preaching has been a, a major influence in my life. And he would preach at us and put the fear of God into us and the fear of our behavior. And so 16 years old, I would get convicted but I'd go back to the same life I was living before camp, back to the same friends, back to the same actions. But leading up to my junior year in high school, I was living under deep conviction and guilt. God wouldn't let me go, wouldn't let me alone. I had older boys that I looked up to that had been living wrong, that had gotten right. And they were preaching at me, and God just really had his thumb on me. And I uh, went into that year, the summer between my junior and senior years, went into youth camp. And God got involved in the preaching. Brother Paul Shiraus was preaching a sermon on playing with fire and talking about Peter warming his hands by the world's fires. And the conviction of God fell on my heart, and I just broke down and started weeping. The youth group started singing a song, Lord, I Need You. And I found myself down at the altar, and we had a revival. We, revival broke out. I mean, there was shouting. We were not a, we were not a good bunch of kids, and that night... Real revival broke out, and several lives of young people changed, and there are still people in the ministry today that were at youth camp that year. And God got involved, and God did a, did a work in us. But one of the major things that was different from that year to all the other years is I actually went home and I started reading my Bible every day. Um, and, and, man, if there's any one thing that you can do, and especially as a young person, that is going to affect your life, and the direction you go and what you do, whether God calls you into ministry or you, you are in a secular field, read your Bible every day. Make, make personal time with the Lord. I'd start just writing verses down that stood out to me. And, you know, I had my yellow legal pad just full of verses because God was beginning to speak to me personally. And I thank God for that. Well, went into, trying to watch the clock here. Thankfully, it's large, but it's also moving fast. Um, Went into my senior year of high school, and at the time, I'll back up a little bit, when I was in seventh grade, my brother, four years older than me, and, and I, I don't like to throw the word around because it sounds so lame these days, um, but he was a bully. He was a bully. He, he, was a, he, was a, he was rough on me, but it was good for me. But when I was in seventh grade, my older brother shot my teeth out with a BB gun. Shot me, it hit me right here, it shattered my front incisor, and it basically broke my lateral incisor off right at the root. So for the next several weeks, I spent a lot of time in a dentist's office. And so as a seventh grader, I became interested in becoming a dentist. Um, it, the work was intriguing, but also what I realized, maybe somewhat through the conversations my dad had with my brother, is I realized dentistry is very expensive. And dentists make a lot of money. And so if you count 32 teeth in a mouth and you start with fillings and you work all the way up nowadays into implants, you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars in every mouth. Now, now some preachers look at people that way, but, um, but that, I, I just wanted to be a dentist. So going into that senior year in high school, my goal, and at the time trying to live for God and, and, and really trying to do right. 
But I went into that senior year, I, had, I was really close to getting 100% academic scholarship. I know many of you are surprised to hear that, but it was public school in Florida, so the standard, you know, it's not real high. But um, I was going into my senior year kind of on the edge of that, and, but at that time, through that senior year, God began to really deal with my heart about going to Bible school, to go into PBI. But I didn't want to be in the ministry. I didn't really have a calling. I didn't have a desire. I didn't have any kind of leading that way. But I knew God wanted me to go to Bible school. So in that year, as I'm looking at becoming the recipient of a, of a full scholarship to get my bachelor's degree, I surrendered to go to Pensacola Bible Institute. I really thought I was giving up the scholarship. Um, but my dad found out I would actually still you'd have seven years to use that scholarship. So I could do three years of PBI and then go into college for four years and get my, you know, my pre-medical bachelor's degree. So that was, my dad was okay with that. Um, he was okay with me trying to go to Bible school, but wanted to make sure I could still get that college degree. Uh, so that was the direction that I went. I just knew God wanted me to learn the Bible. My thoughts honestly were God wants me to get a, a, a grounding in the Word of God before I go off into secular university because these secular universities are, are just robbing and stealing the faith from young people. And so that was what I thought. Well, that was where at Bible school I met my wife. She also got saved young. Her dad was a pastor um, and preacher and, and fantastic Bible teacher, godly mother, godly family. Um, she grew up a, a pastor's daughter. We wound up meeting down at Pensacola Bible Institute. For me, it was love at first sight. I can remember seeing her walk across the front of the church, and I've never taken my eyes off of her since. For her, I don't know how I tricked her, but here we are today. <laughs> but um, I thank God for her, and God brought us together. We were married in 2003, right after I graduated, and I went into college. When we got married, my wife thought I was going to be a dentist. She thought she was marrying a money man. Um, and so I, we married. I started right after graduating PBI. I started it, attending University of West Florida. Again, I, I was in the will of God. I was praying about what God wanted me to do. I was following the open doors, still serving in our local church. So I started going to secular college, and man, I loved, the, I loved school. I loved the, the work. I, I, I enjoyed that so much. I was doing well at it. Um, and I went for a year, two semesters, and physically and, and you know, mentally, and as far as self-fulfillment, I loved it. It was great. But in my heart, spiritually, it was, it was like feeding on the husks. There was nothing to it. There was nothing satisfying spiritually. And again, all this time serving the Lord, I was a fifth grade boy, Sunday school teacher in my church, and active in, in visitation and street preaching and all the ministries. We would help with whatever we could in the church. But there was just something not there. And through that year, God began to trouble me. And God began to burden me. And I always had a burden for missions. Growing up under Dr. Ruckman's ministry, you, you have to have a burden for missions. And I had that burden. And I had me and a good friend of mine had a burden to go help an older man in the ministry somewhere. And uh, so I, that was a burden I had, but a burden's not a calling. Um, and a burden's a good thing for all of us to have. And so I had that burden, and then through that year, it, God did some things. I don't have time to go into all that, but God did some particular things and made it by 2004, April of 2004, Tom Johnson, my wife's aunt and uncle, Tom and Carol Johnson, had gone to New Guinea, started a little church in a little village in the middle of nowhere, and then they had a national preacher that had traveled back to America. And in the spring of 2004, where I was just hungry for whatever God wanted me to do, and, and I could tell that this, you know, secular pursuit was, was just, there was nothing in it, nothing satisfactory for the Lord's glory. And Pastor Brother Willie Himbakawa at the time talked to me about the work in New Guinea and the burden and the need, and it was like holding a stake in front of a hungry lion. And I began to pray at that point about what God wanted me to do. Really, for the first time, God, what do you want me to do? I have this plan. I have this path. I have these opportunities. But what do you want me to do with my life? 
And God began to clearly call and direct us to go over to Papua New Guinea. That was April 2004. Uh, 2005, we took our survey trip there. I'll be getting up into the presentation now. But um, I thank God for his grace in my life, for taking a little, you know, a, an unsaved druggie, putting him in jail, saving his soul, putting him in a Bible-believing church, letting me grow up in that environment. When my parents divorced, by the grace of God, I stayed with my dad, grew up in church, had that influence in my life. You cannot, I, I, I've started to try to say this everywhere, you can't, you can't understand how valuable a life in a local church is, a Bible-believing church especially, and, and what that does for you and how it enriches your life. The music, the, the fellowship, the, the focus, it's just a blessing. And I thank God for that, and then for God getting a hold of me, and then allowing me an opportunity to go into the ministry. And uh, I didn't desire, even finishing PBI, I didn't want to be in the ministry. Even when I surrendered to go to Papua New Guinea, I didn't want to be a minister. I saw the extreme amount of physical work that it takes to live there, and I just wanted to go help Brother Tom Johnson. Um, and that's what we went over there to do. And if we'll have the lights now, I'll get into this, and it'll tie in, hopefully. Um, but uh, pause here to just introduce the rest of my family. My wife, Amy, and then my sons, large, medium, and small. And, uh, you know, we didn't plan it that way, but that's how they came out. No. <laughs> they all came out about the same size, actually, but they're not that way now. But my son, William, is 16. Ian is 12. And then our little one, Owen, is uh, about four and a half years old. And I, I want to say thank God for my family. God has blessed me with a good family, a faithful wife, and uh, a woman that has endured hard, hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and done it joyfully. And I thank God for, for her and the influence that my kids have in their lives through a godly mother. And my family serves with me on the mission field. Um, that's not something I could do or produce. That's the blessings of God upon us, and I thank God for that. Um, but the Lord has called us, the Anderson family, to be missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Um, some, a lot of times people don't even know where Papua New, Papua New Guinea, they think Africa, or they think South America. Um, but Papua New Guinea is the eastern half of the island of New Guinea. This all gets very confusing, but um, it's the eastern half of the island of New Guinea. The western half of the island currently belongs to Indonesia and it is a province of the nation of Indonesia. There's a political boundary, and that's all it is, a line on a map, but it divides that island north to south in the middle, and the eastern half is called the independent state of Papua New Guinea. Um, it formerly was a uh, part of the, it was a territory of Australia after World War II, um, but in 1975, it was granted independence. They didn't fight for it. They're so proud of it, and I tell them all the time, you didn't even fight for your independence. It was just given to you. Um, but they became the independent state of Papua New Guinea. That sits just north of Australia, just south of the equator. Um, it is a beautiful place with vast, rugged mountains, some of the largest swamp lands in the world, mighty rivers. But my favorite, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida on the Gulf Coast. I saw the water almost every day of my life, and if I live in the mountains, I feel claustrophobic. Um, and so my favorite part of New Guinea, of course, is the coasts and islands. It's very beautiful, um, but it is a very diverse nation. I meant to say this a, a minute ago on the, I'll go back, I think I can do that. I'm going to run out of time, but in this island, land, the land mass or land area of just the eastern half, our country, and the independent state of Papua New Guinea, is just slightly larger than the state of California. Um, again, it's divided politically into 22 provinces. Has a population of about 10 million people, but it comes in as one of the most culturally and linguistically diverse nations in the world. They estimate there are about a thousand different tribal groups in Papua New Guinea, and a, more than 800 different tribal languages. And these are not dialects, these are distinct languages. And Papua New Guinea is, I even read something recently where they did a DNA test of two tribes. All that separated these two tribal groups was a river, a fast-flowing river. And they, were, they said they were as genetically different 
as someone from Scotland is from someone from Sri Lanka. So you have diversity in this, in this country. And so thankfully, because of its history with Australia, English is one of the official languages. So in the towns, in the major urbanized centers, you can speak English, and some people can understand you. But then there's also the common language, which is called Melanesian Tokpisin, which is a little bit of what I spoke to you at the start and might give you a little bit more at the end. But that is the language that my family is able to minister in in Papua New Guinea. Most of Papua New Guinea is undeveloped. Uh, it is, they say, only 18% urbanized. Most people do, are not employed, but they live as subsistence farmers and even hunter-gatherers, especially in the area that we lived in first and, and where we are. Um, we don't have large valleys and large open stretches of land where farming can be done, but it's, it's like West Virginia mountains. They're tight little mountains and people have to grow small gardens. Um, so most people will grow a food garden. From that garden, they'll grow some things that they can sell locally at a market and then most people also have a cash crop that they grow, and that depends on the part of New Guinea that you're in. Up in the highlands, coffee is the major cash crop. Um, down where we are, it is cocoa and vanilla. Um, God knew if I lived in the highlands, I like coffee too much. So if I lived in the highlands, I'd be distracted. I would be in the coffee industry. <laughs> so he put me in a part of New Guinea that doesn't grow coffee. So I still drink a lot of coffee, but I don't get to grow it. Um, but uh, down where we are, people, people, they make their cash crops off of cocoa and vanilla. Um, but the national economy is dominated by mineral mining. So there's a lot of political interest and even worldwide political interest in Papua New Guinea because of mineral mining and also natural gas deposits. Um, it is, I'm sorry, so moving forward. In, as I mentioned, in 2005... Uh, the Lord called us over to Papua New Guinea. You could see the difference if, if you can clearly see that photo. My wife looks much more beautiful, um, but I, something has happened to me. Um, but in, this is, this is, I always tell people, this is our very first prayer card. It wasn't actually a card. It was printed by a pastor's wife in Iowa. Um, the Schaefers, if you Spurgeons, you know them, Paul and Jan. Sister Jan printed these on their home printer. That was our first meeting on deputation. Um, she printed these, and so I always tell everyone, if you have a rookie edition prayer card, bring it tonight. I'll sign it. Um, maybe someday it'll be worth money, but probably not. Um, but in 2005, the Lord called us. In 2009, we were able to get to Papua New Guinea and begin working, as I mentioned, with Tom and Carol Johnson, veteran missionaries there. They started and pioneered a work out in Honiac Village in 1996. Uh, they went first in 96, then did um, some deputation, went back to the field in 1998, and they worked in New Guinea until 2013. We're very thankful for the time, uh, I'm sorry, we got there in 2009, where we began to work with them. We actually lived with them our first 13 months in New Guinea. Uh, a lot of good stories came out of that. Um, mainly demonstrating the Johnson's graciousness, uh, having you know, a young, zealous, naive couple come live in their home and try to teach them how to live in this foreign country and, and temper yourself and slow down so that you can actually not just do things, but do things well with wisdom. And we really thank God for the lessons that we learned from them and the time that we had to spend with them while they were on the field in 2013 just due to age-related health issues, they had to leave the field of Papua New Guinea. Um, Sister Carol Johnson has since passed and is with the Lord in glory. Brother Tom Johnson's still out in western Washington, and it, we just thank God for them. We continued to work in the ministry they started in Honiac Village until 2015. In 2015, again, long story, um, God burdened, had already burdened my heart by living in a village, you're really isolated to working with that one village or people group. The village is not open to, I'm not talking about the Christians. The Christians may be open, but the village itself is not open to you using their land and reaching other villages and other people groups. 
So we were pretty, pretty limited to what we could do in the scope of the ministry by living in Honiac Village. And so God gave me the burden and then really made it obvious that we should move out. And we did in 2015. We moved from Honiac Village, 25 miles by road, to the nearby coastal town of Wewak. Wewak is the provincial seat. Um, it is the seat of the East Sepik province. Um, it is the hub, it's the industrial hub, the education hub, the shipping hub for our province and even mainly the province to the west of us, the uh, Sundown province. And so God put us in that place. I believe being in a more central location would allow us more opportunity to minister. And it certainly did. But if you see this blue line, that's not a river, that's the road. Um, and it's 25 miles, but... It takes you a little more than an hour to drive, depending on road conditions, and it only takes five years off of your life every time you do it. Um, and so God let us move into WeWAC in 2017. Uh, so I'll say first, when we moved to WeWAC, God opened doors for us to get involved with multiple different already established churches. The main role God has used us in is to be a support and continued um, counsel and Bible teaching two pastors and churches in New Guinea, and also in youth ministry as well. Um, but in 2015, God let us buy a piece of land. That's another long story. There's lots of long stories here. Um, God let us buy a piece of land in town, a piece of customary land, which recently I got an opportunity to tell Brother Wilson Calvin, he's a Navajo, um, and I told him, yeah, we bought customary land, and he just laughed. Oh, he said, you don't really own that land. I said, exactly, you understand. <laughs> because Papua New Guineans believe that they're biologically connected to their land. And so what we'll, what we'll is a title of lease. Um, but we do have that land secured, and we have already built a small caretaker house on that land. We envision this to be the base of operations for all the different ministries the Lord has us involved in in New Guinea. Um, it went from a, just a piece of bush ground to a piece of almost not bush ground. <laughs> This has been our major project over the last several years, mostly done manually, by hand, no heavy equipment, sometimes not even a chainsaw. We've used machetes and axes to cut trees down and try to get the, the, the bush cut back where we can take ownership of the land from the jungle. And so we're at that point. We have a small caretaker house built there, um, and that's our base of operations. We have a ministry that uh, we just try to be available to what the Lord wants us to do, not really really setting goals and paths and, you know, I, I did that in my early life and learned quickly that it really just pays best to stay open to what the Lord wants you to do and as he leads you and you walk by faith and God does things and it's a blessing. But we're involved in Bible and gospel tract and Bible literature distribution, um, both in our province and even working with some other missionaries in different provinces uh, we do as much visitation and evangelism as we can. Doors are wide open in Papua New Guinea. Um, I used to be able to get into the jail, um, and that COVID af affected that where I couldn't get in. So this term, we started going into the hospital. That's been a huge blessing. Our province, the East Sepik province, has 85 different language groups, and eight, uh, I think around 350,000 people there's no way that I could ever get out to all these different areas just within our province. But this provincial hospital in the town of Wewak is a place where people come from all over to get health care. And so we're able to go in. Uh, my son William has a ministry. He started, designed a website, and works to prepare gift bags uh, with just little basic essentials, water bottles, soap, uh, laundry soap, toothbrush, toothpaste, things of that nature, toilet paper, things the hospitals in New Guinea don't provide for you. Um, and so he prepares bags. It's called Good News and a Gift Hospital Distribution Program, works with the local church visitation ministry. And we go in, each of those bags has a gospel of John, Romans, and Chick Tracks. And then we go in and preach and sing and minister. We've seen souls get saved through that. But really what I envision through that is these people come in, they receive the seed of the word of God, and then they go back out and out to places I could never reach. And so it's a real blessing that we get to do that. Uh, we also work with kids and youth as much as we can. Um, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in church, grew up with so much opportunity, so much ministry poured into my life 
and still tried to wander away from God. And I just want to see these kids have some, some influence, some opportunity to hear the gospel, to, to know that there's a Bible-believing church and, and what that is, to be able to grow up later and say, hey, I remember going to that place and they loved me and they cared for me and they tried to help me and minister to me. And it was a place of joy and it was a place of, of peace so that as they grow up into the wicked world that New Guinea is, they'll remember there was a place and they'll go back. And so just in the last three years, my family mostly does this ministry. We go into the Mini Beach community, which is a very poor, rough settlement community. Um, and that's where the main church that we work with in town is located. Uh, but every Wednesday they go in and do a little kids club class. They teach Bible songs, Bible verses, preach the gospel. In the last three years, we've seen 30 kids get saved just out of that ministry. And so we just look for, we also do kind of what you'd call a vacation Bible school um, type things where we can go do that out in village or in the town and really just look for opportunities to expand those ministries. I preach and teach our focus of ministry. <clears throat> We're not Bible translators. That's another long story. I'll give you, I'll give you that, uh, my doctrinal thesis on that later. Um, but we're not Bible translators, um, especially with New Guinea's history, um, with English present. You could go in and hold up a King James Bible and preach in, in many places in New Guinea. Preach in English with a King James Bible. Um, but we also thankfully have a translation from the King James Bible into Melanesian talk pisin called the King James Pigeon Bible. And so I focus on preaching and teaching the Word of God both publicly and in churches um, house to house, wherever the Lord allows. Um, I've always envisioned having like a full-time Bible institute. Um, it's a danger, though, to have a vision for something that, that you want to see accomplished. And then kind of you set your eyes on that, and then you, the tendency is to overlook anything else that God might want to do along the way. Um, and God helped me realize Papua New Guineans, are, uh, they'll go to school, but they're not school people. Um, they're people of the bush and people of the sea. Um, and a lot of the best opportunities for discipleship and evangelism that I've had have come when I've been out in the jungle carrying wood or cutting wood or working on a car or doing all kinds of things that I don't want to do. I want to teach and preach. But to live there, you've got you to take care of things. Um, and so God has shown me, if you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, most of his discipleship, and most of his preaching and teaching were not done in a church or in a classroom, but they were done in the way of life. And so God's allowed us those opportunities. That's one reason we need to live in New Guinea and live amongst the Papua New Guineans to be able to reach them. Um, our current plans right now, we've been on a short furlough, several months. Um, and we're actually, uh, this is our third to last meeting we have two more meetings the next two Sundays out in California, and then April 15th we head west. We'll have a stopover in Sydney, Australia with our good friends there. I will actually leave my wife and two younger kids there, and me and my oldest son will go up into New Guinea and start building. One of the things we've tried to do on this furlough is raise money to buy a kit house to build on our land, um, and God has allowed us to raise that money, and we're currently... We've already put a down payment on the kit house, and we got to get back over and start doing the site work and the groundwork. And so we're really excited to see the way God raised this money and hope within the next few months to be, um, well, building and hopefully living in our house. Um, that'll be the main focus of, of the next probably year of, min of ministry is building and getting settled into this house. Um, but we also have a long-term vision um, we have a piece of land. We've always envisioned maybe God would allow two or three missionary families to work from one location. Um, that would be helpful on furloughs and medical leaves or visa problems. Those kinds of things happen all the time. Um, and so uh, we, we are praying for that. We also pray for short-term helpers in the sense of builders or anybody that has some skills that wants to come help with these building projects. Um, but our desire there is to work with Papua New Guineans. The danger as an American, um, with our mentality of leadership, which is not always a biblical menta mentality, is to go in, take the point, and 
charge ahead. We can throw money at things. We can throw materials at things. You know, we'll fight a war the way America, uh, uh, our spiritual warfare, the way America fights secular warfare, which is money and machinery. And you can just overwhelm the enemy. Um, but we need to be wise in the approach and work with the men and women of Papua New Guinea. Uh, God, again, the things we learned from the Johnsons and in, in not just running roughshod over the people to get done what you want to get done, but to walk patiently and faithfully and, and learn and see how God wants to use you with these New Guineans. I'd love to see God um, come alongside a you know, young New Guinean man that, of course, I'd love to see it from my own ministry, um, but in the sense of anyone where the way that the Holy Spirit spoke to me personally, my pastor didn't come to me and say, you're going to be a missionary, and we're going to go over there and build you a church building and put you in the building, and now you're a missionary. That's a lot of the history of Baptist missions in New Guinea. I want to see the Holy Spirit get involved and bring up some of these men. And so we got to be willing to work alongside them and live alongside them and be patient and, and, and sow the Word of God into them and give opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work. So that's what we hope to continue to do. Um, we'll get back, as we said, kind of transitioning back to the field over the next several months as we try to build. And then, Lord willing, be there by the grace of God until our bodies can't hold out, um, which is a common pattern in New Guinea, but hopefully more so until the Lord comes. Uh, we want to be serving. You can help us, certainly, by praying. Please take a prayer card. They're on the back table. Um, I ask most, most Christians these days, take a prayer card, but please don't put it inside your Bible. You know, a lot of times people like to just kind of slip it in there. But if you're like most Christians these days, once it goes in there, you never open that. So you'll never see it again. It's a joke, it is, but... But it, might have, it, it also might have stung a little, so I don't know. Um, but take two prayer cards instead and put one on the corner of the television set and one in the middle of the refrigerator door. And that way, you'll never forget to pray for us. And uh, so we really do appreciate that. Um, but you could also pray about going. I, 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 I can plug Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is a difficult place to travel to. It's very expensive. It's very far. Maybe you can't make it to Papua New Guinea. Play, pray about visiting a missionary on a field and see what real life on the mission field is like. It'll give you a greater understanding of how to pray for missionaries, what they go through, what they experience, what their families um, you know, experience. Not all bad, but what they experience and what it's like. And uh, pray about that. And then also giving. The pastor already said you guys would be taking us on for support. I think you said that. I hope you said that, or else this just got really awkward. Um, but um, but we, we live off of the giving of God's people. Uh, I can't work a job in New Guinea. I'm not allowed to, to keep my visa. Um, if I did, it would take away from the time that we have to minister there. I do work a lot of jobs. <laughs> uh, I, we've run a sawmill. I do my own mechanical work. We build and maintain our own you know, even if I rent a house, I'm doing the maintenance on the house. It takes a lot of work to live there. Um, but, but your giving allows us to be there. And it takes care of my family. And it also allows us to do the work of the ministry. So it's not something that we take for granted. But most importantly, your prayers. We need you to pray for us. Um, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Sister Spurgeon just told us she prays for us. We don't take that lightly. We desperately need your prayers. Uh, I don't know what to do there. I need God to lead and direct. And so please do take a prayer card, pray for us. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here.
good morning, everybody, and let's get our hymnals, and we'll stand and sing hymn number 137. Hymn number 137. that that's a little vocal lesson oh you know doing that kind of thing some of you up there are just like where are we going <laughs> just a page over to uh excuse me a couple pages back to 132 132 Amen. resurrection sunday morning songs are like the ones that if you're a smoker we'll figure it out you know what i'm saying <laughs> like you're gonna have to like take some deep breaths some of you are already like whoa maybe we should pray or something no, we're just going to keep singing. <laughs> this is cardiovascular exercise, okay? All right, 132. <laughs> Yeah. 
a quick, quick breath. Quick breath. You ready? Okay, let's go. Number three. Rejoice, rejoice, and praise That's a good singing right there. Brother Stahl, would you go ahead and pray for us this morning, brother? Amen. You may be seated. I do want to give you a couple of brief announcements for the upcoming month of April. The Anchor Baptist Lunch Bunch Fellowship is going to be on Thursday, April 11th at the Blueberry Cafe in Kettering at 1130. Men's Bible Study and Prayer Breakfast is scheduled for Saturday, April the 13th. Uh, that'll be here at 9 o'clock. And then Street Preaching, Saturday, April the 13th and the 27th, uh, leaving here at 1115 a.m. Uh, the ADC the Green County ADC is the 14th and the 28th. Um, and then if you're putting stuff on your calendars, uh, Revival with Dr. Peacock is going to be the May, May 13th through the 20th. And, of course, Anchor Baptist Youth Camp, that's going to be the 22nd through the 27th of July. We should have all of the information up on the website. Uh, I thought we are going to do it by the end of this week, but or last week, but we're going to do it by the end of next week. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> Um, so we'll have that up there, and so if anybody that you're talking to, you can direct them directly to the website, and they can register and do all that stuff on there, and uh, once we have it up, we'll make an announcement. I'll have Paige send it out through the, uh, um, the group uh, message, and if you have any questions, you can get with me about that. All right, if we could have our regular ushers for the offering come up, and then the ones that I talked to about communion, you guys can come up once Pastor announces that, but regular offering um, now here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You got double duty today. Man, I'm going to pay you extra. <laughs> it's my turn. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. So I was just living my life yesterday, and then I had this epiphany. I said, wow. Um, I was thinking, like, you know, Resurrection Sunday's tomorrow. And I just started thinking, it's like, you know, I always personally take it for granted, you know, what Jesus did for me. When he died on the cross, he went through, you know, all that torture. Like, I, I, would, I would never do that. I would I'd give up. But um, that, thinking about that, that really put my Christian life into perspective. And I just said, wow, what a, what a blessing it is. So anyways. Um, Lord, thank you for letting everyone come out here safely today. Um, bless this offering. Bless the giver. Um, help this service go up. Um, help us all. There are hearts for communion. In your name, amen.
take our hymnals. We'll stand again and turn to hymn number 138. And then the choir is going to sing for us this morning. They've been working hard over the last month or so, and we're excited to hear them sing. And then after the choir, pastor will come up and lead us in uh, our communion service. And so those of you that uh, have already been chosen to be uh, ushers for that service, that's when you'll come up uh, when pastor gets up here after the special. All right, so hymn number 138 before everything else goes on here this morning. Amen. you come on up and brother do you need anything special brother adam where you at oh here you are you need anything special for choir mic wise you good
Well, that's the first, that was our first choir. Y'all do really good, man. And what we'll do is we'll build some chairs back here and put them up on the wall here. We'll build a little place up here where y'all can actually get up here and have your little choir robes and all that. I was just joking. <laughs> Well, that's a blessing, man. I mean, it's, it really, you guys, it's your church. And when uh, you say, hey, can I do this? Yeah, you can do anything you want. Uh, within reason, within reason. Uh, I don't want to give you a blank check on a thing, but I'm telling you, man, that uh, the serving Jesus Christ should be fun. And it shouldn't be anything sad about it. Take your Bibles, go real quick. We're doing everything a little bit different today because we got a missionary in today. And it was uh, Brother Anderson was the only time I could get him in before he goes back to Papua New Guinea. And I really wanted to get him in here, him and his wife and his family. Uh, it was just a blessing. I seen him down in Jacksonville. And, and uh, right then and there, I knew I, I just you could hear somebody. And, uh, Brother, I'm telling you, the, the spirit will come across between two people real quick. And you can hear in somebody's voice and, and their infractions and everything else exactly where they stand with Jesus Christ. And I knew right then and there, I said, well, I, I, then I talked to Dr. Peacock and I said, yeah, I think I'm going to pick him up. Uh, and I tell you, it's just a blessing. It's just a blessing. They'll be back tonight. He's going to preach tonight. And the reason we're changing everything up, usually we have communion tonight. But I wanted to give him as much time as I could tonight. So we're going to do that today. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you go there real fast, I'm going to read a couple of verses here. And Paul, uh, Jesus Christ gave the church two ordinances. That's all he gave us. Really, uh, when it all boils right down to it, if, if you will do these two things, you're, you're, you're ahead of the world in a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways. I was born and raised Roman Catholic, and we had communion every, uh, confession and communion every Sunday. And, and I'm telling you what, it's just a farce is the way they do it. They don't do it the right way. But uh, first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 Paul said basically the same thing he says here. He says over a couple chapters over in, in first, uh, first Corinthians 15, 3, he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So Paul is given to you what he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul received, he received the gospel from Jesus Christ, and that's what he was given out. Well, here he's received this from the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the ordinance. For I received, verse 23, for I received... Of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he uh, was betrayed, took bread, and, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Uh, it's not something that you do to, to think that, hey, I just ate Jesus Christ or I, I'm doing this. No, you remember what he did, like the brother said a few minutes ago, what he did at Calvary for you 2,000 years ago. And it says, verse 25, and after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the cup of the, uh, this cup is of the, uh, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat uh, this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Uh, wherefore, uh, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man so examine himself, and so let him eat uh, of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. For when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Father, again, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for the passage of Scripture. Thank you for our brother Paul. 2,000 years ago, Lord, that you put in his heart to write some things down, and he wrote them down for our admonition years later, Lord, and it's just a blessing to have a Bible in our hands. Uh, bless the, the morning service, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If I could get those four men up here. Uh, the communion is, is one of the two ordinances. Baptism is the other. And uh, I tell you, the day I, the, I got saved... And, I, I, I was at a Southern Baptist church also, and I was sitting back there about where Rich is, and I, I knew, I said, hey, man, I want to do whatever Jesus Christ did. If I can do that thing, that's what I want to do. That's the closest you'll ever get to the Lord Jesus Christ is to find out what he did, and you try to do the same thing. He said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. You know what the one thing you ought to do is try to win souls. That's just what you ought to do uh, because that's what he did. Well, when he said get baptized, I didn't know the, the ordinances and all that stuff at the time. I had just been saved for a couple of weeks. But I went down and seen my uncle. I said, hey, I want to get wet, man. And he said, what is that? I said, I want to get baptized. That's what I want. He asked me right there, what do you want to do? I said, I want to get baptized. And then years later, I started realizing what this is. 
if you're with us today, and they, they have several types of communion in churches, closed communion, open communion, I, I, I really don't care. Uh, if you've examined yourself, if you know you're saved in here this morning and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're my brother or sister in Christ. Amen. Bottom line. Uh, if, you, if you take the next couple minutes and, and anything that's in between, you just bow your head and say, Lord, is there anything between you and me right now? Uh, Lord, what is it? And he says, get the th- examine yourself, get it under the blood, get a clean heart for the moment, a clean slate for the moment, and have communion. Because that's something the Lord told you to do. You know what you do? You follow him. Baptism is nothing more than following the Lord Jesus Christ in the death, burial, and resurrection. That's all that is. You get wet. I put you underwater. You say, well, why would I do that? Because that's what he did. And then the rest of your life, you know what you do? You just go out one day. Uh, Brother Anderson and myself was talking yesterday, and, and we, do, we do kind of mirror each other. I don't like to do anything until I know exactly what the Lord wants me to do. Because if you do anything, I find myself backtracking. I would just soon wait till he tells me what to do, and he's already got me moving in that direction. I'm, I'm gone with it. So it says right here, For I have received of the Lord, which I also deliver unto you, that the, the Lord, uh, the night, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So if y'all would grab the, the bread and pass it out. Then we'll pass the, the grape juice out. It's not fermented. And when y'all get to the back, go to the nursery. Somebody go to the nursery and take care of them. You want to pray for us, brother? Uh, thank you for uh, uh, what you did on the cross, Lord. And more importantly, we thank you for that uh, three days later you rose again. Amen. And uh, that, uh, we're just able to be here to uh, uh, remember that, remember what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for uh, your saving power, Lord, and saving uh, each one of us. Lord, just ask that you would uh, be, with at this, be with us at this time. Lord, bless us. Uh, and just um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. While you're sitting there, just think about just think about your life and what you've been doing, and and just ask the Lord, is there anything there, anything between us, Lord, just between me and you, and get that thing out and and have a clean slate. I tell you what, it's a I like First John, uh, chapter one says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's He's ready to forgive at any moment. Uh, we got a merciful and gracious God. Distance. Somebody go back to the nursery. Okay. It's been really good to be in church already today. <laughs> Had a good time. Sing is great. Anybody ready for a missions trip? No. <laughs> yeah, y'all can come on back up now. We got to do the other one too.
When you take the bread, it's a, it's a picture of the body of Jesus Christ being broken for you. His body was broken for us 2,000 years ago. And uh, pray, Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. And Lord, thank you for just the privilege of coming together. And Lord, uh, an opportunity, it's a time every year we do the same thing, Lord, but it's, it's something that we should do that never, uh, we should never put in the background, Lord, something that will help us remember you. Uh, Lord, remembering what you did for us is, is uh, the greatest thing that ever happened to any one person once you get a hold of salvation. Lord, I, I uh, pray that you'd bless this communion, that you'd bless our fellowship and the uh, service this morning, Lord, but uh, right now, Lord, that you'd help everybody clear their hearts and get uh, their their thoughts uh, right where they need to be, just on you. And, Lord, that you would uh, forgive any sin that's uh, between us and you. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you forgive mine, Lord. I try not to hide anything from you. I try to lay it in before your feet all the time. Sit, come boldly into the throne of grace. Uh, Lord, uh, and that's what we seek today is grace. Uh, bless this communion. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It says right here, it says, and at the same manner he took uh, the cups. He said, but uh, back before that, he says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body. After the same manner, he took the cups. So I'll let you pass those out. Did you get a Did you get any bread? Hey Dustin, could you get Sarah back there in the back? You guys can do the back rows there. You already done them? Oh, y'all good, man. I'm going to double y'all salary. That's a joke around here. We don't pay nobody nothing. <laughs> Makes them feel good, though. You care. <laughs>
he says right here, he says, after the same manner also took, uh, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this is the cup in the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Your brothers can be, you can sit down. Well, amen. Now that's a communion service. It's not really long. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be done, I think, in order, decent and in order. I believe that was it. Uh, uh, we may start doing that every Sunday morning, because that way you get to most of the people. Here, take your Bibles real quick. <laughs> I'm going to get back here now. I'll be done by 2 or 3 o'clock. But no, I really, I, I, can, I can go fast, maybe. Go to Z, uh, Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. It's a couple, it's the second to the last book of the Old Testament in your Bible. I was finishing my Bible up, and read through Zechariah and Malachi, and come across the verse... Uh, and I started thinking about it, and I have some other verses marked in uh, Ze- uh, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, uh, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning, and thank you for letting us... Uh, come to church. Lord, thank you for the church to come to. Thank you for the, uh, the mission report we had during Sunday school, and thank you for allowing us to have communion. Uh, Lord, and now I pray that you put your uh, hand upon this message just for a moment, uh, Lord, and then uh, that you bless the afternoon, and bless us again when we come back this evening, Father, to hear more from you, and uh, Lord, from your men, that, the man that works in Papua New Guinea, Lord, what a blessing that is. Uh, Father, thank you for men and women still willing to go put their lives at risk, Lord, and, and uh, the hardship, and and try to get a work started and, and uh, put their life and effort into it. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the effort that is done. Uh, Lord, there's men all across this country doing the same thing. Think of Brother Yoakum today, Lord, out with the Navajo Indians. I pray that you'd put your hand upon him. What a blessing he is. Uh, Lord, again, just uh, be with us for the next couple of minutes here. And, uh, Father, we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this message is The Branch of God. And as I was reading through Ezekiel, you know, a lot of, or Zechariah, a lot of times what you'll do is uh, you'll get a message, and, uh, and everybody will stick to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John toward the last part of it and the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And all through your Bible, uh, when I say a lot of times that you need to learn how to read your Bible, just read through it. Uh, Dr. Roman always said that he did a lot of his study, and when he read his Bible, he just read it. And the more you read it, I was talking to Beth yesterday, and, and he said he had quit read, counting at 150 times. I said, I would never catch up with that guy. I'd have to read it 10 times a, a year. If I started reading it 10 times a year for the next 10 years, that's only 100 times. I still wouldn't be caught. I'd take, it'd take 15 years uh, for me to get to that magic number of 150 times. And I count, and my daughter would come up, and what a blessing she was. She goes, well, Dad, but you haven't counted all the times you read it before that. I said, yeah, but it hadn't been like that. And you know what you do when you sit there and you talk to a man like that? He just, he, he just what he says, I mean, the Bible just comes out of him. And the more you read that thing, what you'll find out is from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus Christ. And it's always been about him and everything he's going to do. And what a great God we serve. I'm telling you what, one of these days, this thing's going to be over. I don't know how soon that's going to be. I, today is transgender versus whatever day. And I'm like, puke. Well, every year on March the 31st, it just so happens Easter falls on this. But I'm like, why in the world do we even care? You know what they're doing? They're, they're trying to start division between us. But I like verses like, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. I got it, man. I don't have to worry about one thing that goes on on the face of this planet. I just need to back up and slow down and let Jesus have control. There's nothing they can. You ever read back in Kings, Second Kings? That stuff goes on all over the place, man. There was times where the whole country was nothing but a bunch of Baalites, and they were all worshiping. I like Jehu, man. Jehu's a mess. You know what Jehu did? He said, let's worship Baal, man. He gets them all together and kills them. Now, that sounds a little mean for Resurrection Sunday, but they killed my Savior. They took him out. I don't like that. Zechariah sits here and starts talking, and it says, hear now. He says, Zechariah, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. The word branch shows up in the Old Testament six times, and four of those times, uh, in Jeremiah 3, 23, 5, it says, Behold, 
The days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. This is already, that's already happened. That happened 2,000 years ago, by the way. But just a little comma, just a little comma there, the righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper. That hasn't happened yet. It's getting ready to happen. It's going to happen out a little ways from now. Sometimes you read your Bible and a comma will separate 2,000 years. And we're sitting right in that comma. I heard an old preacher one time, and I've heard other people say the same thing. You go to a graveyard, and it says, born this date, died this date, and there's a dash in it. That's your life. Your life is a dash. What kind of dash are you? I want a long dash. I want a dash so full. Not that I've had a long life. I just want my dash to be long enough to say that hey, I did something in that life. It wasn't just a piece of rock. Uh, in Zechariah 6.12, a couple of chapters over, uh, it's, uh, it says this, and speak unto him. So he talks about a king. Matthew, Matthew uh, the book of Matthew gives you the, the picture of a king when you read through there. It gives you that picture. But in Zechariah 6.12, it says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, and behold, saying, Behold the man whose name is a branch. Luke gives you the picture of Jesus Christ as a man. And then when you get to the fourth one here, it says, in Isaiah 4.2, it says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful. Hey, that hasn't happened yet. It's coming out there somewhere. But that right there is the Son of God. That's a picture of John. And then I mentioned here in Zechariah 3.8, he said, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant. It pictures him as a servant. You know, the hardest thing you'll ever learn in life is how to be a servant. Jesus Christ was the master at that. He was the king of kings. He stepped off a throne, and it never bothered him one second to step off his throne. He knew that what he was doing was going to get us. If you're in this room today and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know what? He's got you. He's got your back. There's nothing better to know that somebody's got your back, especially when you mess up. I worked for a man one time, and I, I, I did something wrong, and uh, I went in his office, and I tried to give him some excuses. Mike, is, all you ever got is excuses. Do you got an excuse for everything? And I looked at him, and I can still remember the guy's name, and I said, no. I said, you know what? I said, I, I messed up. He goes, yeah, you did. Get, up, get back out there and work. You know that man had my back? And I started watching some men in life that I would work with, and I watched these guys. You do everything in the world to do the best you can, and, and you mess up every now and then, and they got your back. And they're always willing to take a, you know what Jesus Christ is? He's got my back. He's had my back for 20, uh, 43 years. I thank God for that, man. Uh, I had a dad that was a drunk man. He was a mess. And he, he didn't get saved before. Well, he got saved before I got saved. He was saved a long time ago before he was, he was just the best saved drunk you've ever seen. But he finally got his life right. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. Zechariah sits there and starts talking about the Lord. You know, you can find the crucifixion. You can find the life of Christ in just about any Bible you want to go, any, any chapter, any book you want to find. You go into your Bible and start reading that thing through there. And what you're going to do, Zechariah starts over here with, with he says, a servant in chapter 3. You get to chapter 9 and it starts talking about him coming into Jerusalem. It says, O daughters of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, the, upon a colt, the fold of an ass. That's a triumph, triumphal end. That's in your Old Testament. You know what happens when you miss reading your Old Testament? You miss a lot of this stuff. You don't have to always go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and go to the last couple chapters to see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's more, brethren, it's more than that. Boy, I thank God for that. If it wasn't for that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be going to heaven today. But it's more than that. Brother, we got a place to go to when this thing is all over. And we got a life that's going to go forever and ever and ever. And I have no idea what he's going to have us doing out there. It boggles my mind. I, I sit there, look, think about that thing from time to time. I say, Lord, how in the world, number one, can you straighten me out? I said, I'm so messed up in my mind and in my heart. How can you possibly? I can't even fathom that other than you saying you can do it. I won't know how to act. When he takes away all this facade that's me and there's nothing left but what he wants out of that thing, and I'm going to be just like him, 
I can't, I can't even begin to understand. I want to be that way. I tell him all the time, I say, Lord, that's all I ever wanted was to be like you. He said, you will be one day. That day just hadn't come yet. That's a triumphal, triumphant entry. He came into Jerusalem riding on an ass, a donkey. And people look at him. He didn't care. You know, so many times in this world, the world tells us we should be this way or we should be that way. You should look like this. You should have this. You should have that. Jesus Christ had it all. And he didn't care what he looked like coming in. He didn't care about getting on a donkey and riding into eat. He, he'd have done anything. He walked all the time. He fed. He, 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 he ate with lepers. He ate with sinners. He ate with publicans. He didn't care. He went out and reached them. You know what he did? He came to seek and save that which was lost, which was a great thing. The world considered him a failure. Look at him, man. He's a failure. He's not one of us. He's not up here with the scribes and the Pharisees in the temple. Paul was said, I still think Paul had a, a place in this ministry where uh, he was with the Pharisees and the scribes, and Gamaliel had taught him, and, and he was out there somewhere. He knew all about Jesus Christ before he went to the cross. I believe Paul, there was no way Paul could have not known that, knowing what he, he taught and when he got knocked down on the road to Damascus. There's just no way. He had to know that stuff. Paul was on this side over here thinking, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get, climb the ladder of success and I'm going to be everything they want me to be. And then all of a sudden one day he found out all that stuff was wrong. Look for, they looked for any way they could rid themselves of him. All he did throughout his whole ministry, his whole life, was good. He never did bad. Good, 100% of the time. They said, we find no fault in him. Paul, uh, Pilate said it three times, I find no fault in him. And yet they still took him to the cross. You look at our government today. We're no different today than they were back then. Amen. We got government officials today that make up the rules as they go along. And they have law. But they do whatever they want to do. And use your money to do it. And you sit there and say, well, I'm, a, I'm appalled at that. Yeah, but they did it to Jesus Christ back 2,000 years ago. They didn't change. They haven't ever changed a thing. He said rejoice. Jesus comes into triumphant entry. He comes into Jerusalem. In Zechariah 11, 12, this is just going through Zechariah real quick. I can go through this, I mean, real fast. Zechariah 11, 12. I like this book, man. I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price. If not, forbear. So they weighed out, weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. That's Jesus Christ right there. That's the Pharisees giving Judas 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus Christ. Guess this back again. You say, well, yeah, you just made it up. Look at 13. And the Lord said unto me, cast it under the potter, a goodly price that I was praised, priced, uh, priced uh, at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. You know what they did? They bought a potter's field with it to bury strangers. That's Jesus Christ right there. It gets you to the place where all the way up to the, where he's in the garden, he's betrayed by Judas. You don't need to necessarily go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get that picture. It's all through your Bible. If you just stop and read your Bible and say, Lord, you know what the Lord's done is he's given you through here. I like, somebody asked me the other day. I said over in Isaiah, it says line upon line, precept. Go take your Bible real quick. Go to Isaiah chapter 28. You need to read this. This is a great passage. It's a great passage. It's an individual passage. Isaiah 28. Man, I know it's here somewhere. I got Isaiah 28 somewhere. I thought it was 11. Where's that? Has anybody got it? I'm in 27, 28. It says line upon line, precept upon precept. 13. What is it? 13? Thank you. No, it's done 28, 13. 10. 10. 9, 8, 7. No, that's not 28. Oh, I'm in Proverbs. No wonder it don't look right. <laughs> wow. I'm sitting there going, whoso causes the right? I'm like, man, I don't sound like that. <laughs> See, I need to learn how to not only read your Bible, but know where the books are. That would help too, you know. Read. I, I thought, I said, man, I know I got that, man. Uh, marked in here, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? You know what God wants to do? You know what the Lord wants to do? You know what the Holy Spirit wants to do is teach you something. Whom shall he teach knowledge? 
And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk. That's right here, brethren. That's right here. Him that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You're going to get it a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here. And it makes those stories a little bit better as you read them in other places. He says, for with stammering lips and another tongue he, uh, will he speak to his people. For whom he said, this is the, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith uh, ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. But they would not hear. You know, there's some people that won't hear. And if you won't, Guess what? Read 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared. You know what your, what your Bible is in front of you? It's a way between life and death. And the Lord says, what do you want? And you make a choice. You say, I, I, I choose life. The Lord says, good move, good move. How about this? And you go, oh, I didn't know about that. He goes, well, how about this? Somebody else will say, I don't want nothing to do with you. He said, okay, and he'll, he'll pull his hand back, and he'll let you go little by little, the same book, little by little, the wrong way. And pretty soon, you're so far away from where you should be, you, you can't even understand it. You won't even understand it. He'll, he'll remove it from you. But the other person will little by little get closer and closer, and this thing starts getting sweeter and sweeter and sweeter, and you start reading through there, and you'll start seeing him on every page. When Isaiah, when Abraham's up there ready to stab his son, you see Jesus Christ carrying the wood up the side of the mountain. When he comes into the, uh, Moses comes in to take him out, and, he, and they put blood on the doorpost. You see the lintel on the two doorposts. You see a cross sitting there, and the angel of death walks right by, and he says, that's my son. You start seeing it, and other people say, oh, you just make all that up. No, it's all over this book. Zechariah, Jesus was arrested in the garden. They took him out. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs. He had to become like you and me so that he could, that he as God could understand completely our, our scenario or our predicament. As God, he knew no sin. And sin was the farthest thing from him. But that's where we live. We live and dwell in that. You know how much he loved you? He came down here and was born of a woman, lived a life just like he lived, came into the world just like he came into, did everything he was supposed to, rode into Jerusalem on those donkeys, knowing he's headed to a cross for you. He said, 53, 4, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. There is nothing that you can have that you can't bring to him. Brother, it's like he said right here on the uh, taking the communion. He said, examine yourselves. You should always have everything in before the Lord Jesus Christ, right at his feet. Come boldly into the You should be right there. Don't ever try to hide nothing from him. He already knows it anyways. Amen. You know what the devil wants you to do is hide like Adam and Eve in the garden, and you go hide behind a bush somewhere like you don't think God knows you where you're at. He didn't say, Adam, where art thou? Because he didn't know where he was at. He wanted Adam to admit where he was at. You know what God wants you to do? Be, a, be honest. That's all. You know what God's looking for? Somebody who's honest with themselves and with him. It's an amazing book. Just an amazing book. They delivered to the council. They delivered him to the council. They came into the garden and took him out of the garden and took him to the scribes and the Pharisees at the council. And they brought him before Pilate. They transferred him to Herod like, hey, I can get rid of this thing. You can't get rid of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever tried. I have never been able to do that. He's always, Brother Anderson was talking about being uh, backslid. I think I'm backslid half the time of my life because everywhere I go, there he is. You can't get away from him. And, if, and, if, and he knows you and he's going he's to seek and save you. He's going to seek and save that which was lost. He's going to come after you. He's never going to let you by yourself. Pilate thought he could transfer him to Herod. It didn't work. He returned him to the judgment hall. And at the hands of the Roman soldiers, Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Every stripe that was placed upon him was because of our sin. The sins of the world. Everything that he went through at Calvary. He was bruised for our iniquities. For your iniquities, your sin. He said Satan was perfect until iniquity was found, until sin was found into him. That's where Satan got kicked out of heaven because iniquity. He chose to sin. You know, you chose to sin too. He said, he goes right here, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. 
We had no peace. Well, I got perfect peace with God right now. I am waiting for that day. This world is crazy. I watch, I watch just about a smidge of the news. I can only stomach a little bit of the radio programs anymore uh, because you go back and forth on that thing and you start listening to all that stuff. And I'm like, that, all that does is make you afraid or make you scared. And I'm like, Lord, you have total control. You know, I like reading my Bible when he sits there and says, tell you God, look up at the sky, man. He looks up and sees all the chariots of fire and he goes, you don't have to worry about taking this. Gideon, you don't have to worry about nothing. You, actually, let me rephrase that. God and you, the Lord Jesus Christ and you, are a majority. You don't have to worry about one thing on this planet. Anything, fear, fear gets in the way of you having a really good time with Jesus Christ. It does. And he says, and with his stripes we are healed at Calvary. Jesus Christ, they took him, finally got him to the cross, but when they got in there, he was stri- his body was just riddled with stripes, blood pouring out everywhere. There's, there's no way, I said this to somebody the other day, there's no way that you could ever depict what he went through. I don't care how good of a doctor you are. I don't care how good of an artist you are. I don't care how good of anything you are. You could not depict what God did for you. You can get, you can get some images in our mind. Uh, what's his face? Mel Gibson. Not Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson? Yeah, he did The Passion. That isn't even close. That isn't even close. All it does is it appeals to our emotional side and makes us feel, you, that isn't close. You could not kill him. He would not die on that cross until he said it's finished. No matter what you did, you could not kill him until it was done. He said, you'll not break a bone in my body. He says that over in Psalms. And guess what? On the cross, they didn't break a bone in his body. When he says something, it's going to happen. You don't have to worry about that. Jesus was condemned to be crucified. His nation convicted him. They set him up, just like they're doing to, you, you get poli- all over the country, all over the world, political uh, uh, opponents to the government, they'll set them up in a heartbeat. You thought, we thought America was above all that. America's not anywhere near above that. They're doing it right now. It's a crazy thing. But guess what? They've done it from the beginning of the world. And guess they'll do it again. I don't even, why should that bother me? It doesn't. I let it go. His nation convicted him, John 19, 7. The Jews answered, we have a law, and by our law, he ought to die. What did he do? Nothing. He did absolutely nothing. And they said, our law says he should die. Our law says he shouldn't be able to vote. You can't, you can't put him on the ballot anywhere. Who? Whoa, where did that come from? I, I did have some, some encouragement when the, the 9 to 0 in the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. And three of them were Democrats. I'm like, great, man. I was impressed that the six Republicans got all together and said something right. Let God have the choice. You know, they don't want God to have the choice. There's where the problem is. Our president gets up and says today is transgender. That's the worst you could possibly ever even. I would never even said it. And then what's worse after that, he goes, and I'm a Christian, and I'm going to be worshiping and having Easter with my family. You wicked devil. You said, you shouldn't call it. That man's a wicked devil. Happy Easter. (laughs) You ought to get mad about something. He ought to shut his mouth. I know they have it every 31st of March every year and a bunch of trans. I got that. But he shouldn't have said nothing about it and lifted it up. What a mess. The dying thief confessed him. He said, but this man had done nothing amiss. A lost man hanging on a cross, suffering like Jesus Christ, confessed that Jesus Christ was it. This is the, past, this is the present, the past back there. What had, Simon was compelled for him. He, he compelled to carry his cross. That was Simon. And he did it. The soldiers considered him. You know, a lot of people consider Jesus Christ. They just sit there. They sit there and, 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 bo- and they sit down and watched him. I don't see how you could watch somebody go through what he went through. The thief on the cross got it. And those guys just sit down and watched him. Like, how in the world? He should have been dead before he ever got there. What they did to him in in the the hall of judgment, what they did to him before he ever got there, he should have never got there. But that's our Lord. And he said, I will get there. And he had somebody to help him. He needed some help as a man. The masses were critical of him. Matthew 27, 39 says, and they, and they that passed by reviled, wagging their heads at him. You saved others, save yourself. And missing the whole thing. Missing the whole thing. They think they're getting rid of him. 
It says that in uh, Psalm 109.3, it says they hated me without a cause. They had no cause. You know, today we have no cause not to serve Jesus Christ. We have no cause to give him, we have no cause not to give him our lives. We have no cause to realize that everything we have is his. We, there is no cause. When you look at what he did, it's his. He built it. It's his. What he's placed at my fingertips is his. It never was mine. There's nothing that I have that is mine. It's his. Every bit of it's his. People say, how can you do what you do? I'm like, I don't know what else to do. It's his. You know what he did? He gave me a wife that thinks the same way. She's worse than I am. She'll give more stuff away. I, I took him. Mike, I, I gave this away. I'm like, you, 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 uh, I love you, Beth. <laughs> and then I go, Lord, she's worse than I am, man. He goes, yeah. He goes, but that's what I gave you. See, I had something for you to do. And what I, you needed was somebody like that to be with you to help you do that stuff. And every now and then when you get a little weak, she's your strength. He said, I gave you your match, your perfect match. The masses were critical of him. His converts watched him. Joseph and Nicodemus. And all the women, John, Peter was a far off. Poor Peter. He gets a lot of, the, have you ever thought about, uh, you had a whole Roman army after you? You got all the Pharisees and scribes and, and the, the high priest and everything and wanting to kill you? Uh, I, I would have I run too, man. I'd have run. I would have been just like Peter. I'd have probably been gone way before Peter was gone. I mean I, I, I mean, I look at that thing and I'm sitting there going, we judge a man for what he did many, many years ago. The Lord didn't judge him. Lord said, hey, Peter, by the way, before uh, the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. He said, you're going to do it. He said, you're, no, I won't, no, I won't. Oh, yeah, you will, yeah, you will. Peter did it, and he turned around and looked at him and said, ah, I mean, like, you can see it in his eyes. He didn't say a word. He's like, I told you, man, I told you, you wouldn't listen. Peter said, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. Peter knew it, but his converts got to watch him. Matt, Matthew, or Luke 23, 27 says, and there followed him a great company of people and women, which also bewildered and lamented. They didn't know what was getting ready to happen to their Savior. But Christ the Savior, in the midst of all of that, he's hanging on a cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, a lot of times we just don't know what we're doing. Brother Anderson said that this morning in his message. He said, sometimes we'll, we'll think we know what we're doing and we'll head headlong because we'll use the world system in how we're doing what we're doing. And, the, and their, their way they manage and the way they do everything will try to apply that to God. And it doesn't work. You know what I found out? I just stop and wait. People say, you always wait till the last minute. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I, well, I need the Lord to tell me what to do. Now, when I know what he's told me to do, I'm going to put everything I got in it. But I'm not going to put nothing into it until I know what he told me to do. Because I found out that a lot of times, and I've watched other brothers, you back up. And you have to correct, and I don't have time to correct anything. I'm 60, I'll be 67 years old this year. I don't have time to correct nothing. I don't want to correct nothing. I just want to do what he wants to be, what it wants done, and do it the first time and just be done with it and move on to the next thing. Christ forgave him. And then he redeemed that thief on the cross. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Boy, I don't know about you, but you're talking about a heart lifting. That man was dying on that cross with no no thought of what the future or no idea where he was going to go. He probably knew he was on his way right to a devil's hell. He already probably knew that. Yeah. But he had no choice. He had nothing else. In moments, he was going to be gone. And the comforting words that rolled off the lips of Jesus Christ in the agony and the pain that he was at, and he's hanging there on that cross, and he looks over to God and says, Hey, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Boy, could you imagine the peace that rolled across that man's soul? All of a sudden, he goes, oh, whoa, man, today I'm going to be. He was probably singing something, amazing grace. I mean, he was singing them all, man. He was going right down all those songs. Somebody said, where would you get that at? It ain't written yet, but I know it's coming. It's a great song. <laughs> that was the past. That's Zechariah. Take your Bibles. Go over to Acts 1-6 real quick. Then we're going to go right back to Zechariah and finish it up. That was the past. You know what the present is right now? You're in the present. You're here today, 2,000 years after that time. That my Lord said, he's not dead anymore. He is risen. Brother Yoakum sent me a note today, and he said, I do read, brother. I do read my text. You just don't believe it. I really do. But Yo Yoakum sent me this text, and he said, uh, he's not here. He's risen. You bet he's risen, man. He's gone. Acts 1-6 says, 
When they therefore were come together, they asked him. So Jesus is still walking the planet. If, if, it isn't, if it isn't strange enough he died and rose from the dead, he's still walking and talking to him right here. It's, you got an amazing God. And when they were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will, uh, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's what they're thinking. You're going to put this thing back together? He goes, no, I'm not ready yet. You're trying to jump the gun. You're trying to get the, the cart before the horse. You need to slow this thing down. Take it little bit by little bit. Hey, I remember a time when I was by myself on a ship all by myself. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have no kids. I, didn't have, I had a church back in port that I'd go to, but I didn't have, we didn't have this. And all of a sudden, here this is. And every time I see this, I'm sitting here going, Lord. <laughs> I remember. He goes, yeah, don't ever forget, Mike. Don't you ever forget. This is not you. It has nothing to do with me. If I left out here tomorrow, you know what y'all's responsibility is? Is to do the same thing you're doing right now. And then try to get somebody else into it with you. That's what your responsibility is. And the Lord works that thing. I heard a preacher say the other day, Christianity works by itself. All you got to do is let the Lord do it. If you would live it, you would find out other people would live it. I never thought in a million years I'd ever get to be a pastor of a church. I never desired to be a pastor of a church. That's just what happened. <laughs> you say, what is it? It's the present. And, the, and verse 7, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know. There's some things you just ain't supposed to know. The times and the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. And here's a mission verse if you've ever seen one. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. That's your home, that's your home turf. And in Judea. That's, that's the surrounding areas. And in Samaria, that's anywhere else out there, Cincinnati, Los Angeles, wherever you want to go, and the other most parts of the earth. That's where you got to get somebody in Papua New Guinea. If you ain't going to go to Papua New Guinea, you better be putting some money in the plate to get him over there and keep him there. He's already there. You know what he needs is your support to get him there and keep him there and take care of his family while he's there. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, that's what a lot of us do. We just stand there and we look up. That's what sheep do. Uh, that's not what you're supposed to do. An angel rebuked them here. It was a loving rebuke. Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you mean a Galilee? Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Don't you have something to do? Brethren, we got jails, we got uh, visitation, we got door knocking, we got, you got, you want to start a nursing home, whatever you want to start, whatever you want to do, there's something to do. Which also said, why stand you gazing on heaven, the same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back to get us. Amen. Shortly, he's coming back to get us. We're in the present right now. Amen. Go back to Zechariah, two verses and I'll be done. Zechariah. This is all in Zechariah. Brother, you can get every bit of that thing out of your Old Testament. The death, burial, the resurrection, and living. I like Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. Am I in the right place? Zechariah 12, 9. And it shall come to pass. 12, 9. And it shall come to pass. In that day that I will uh, seek to destroy all the nations that come against uh, Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's Jesus Christ. There's coming a day out there in the future somewhere that it's all going to be said and done, and the millennium is going to start, and it's going to run on through there, and they're going to come up, and they're going to look at Jesus, and the scars are still going to be there, but he's still king. He's king of kings now. He's not... Right here, he is no more, no more a lowly servant coming into Jerusalem. He is now king of kings and lord of lords. And when you look at him, you're going to still see the marks in his hands. And those that he redeemed are going to know exactly what those are. And they're going to look at those things and you wonder why you get there in Revelation and they're worshiping and howling and screaming in heaven all. The, I mean, you just got multitudes and multitudes of people shouting and you can't only get Baptists to shout, man. They, they think, I've been in churches, man, where they look at me like, you need to be quiet. I'm like, I thought, I thought we were supposed to like sing. 
But they said, but you can't sing. Well, I thought we were supposed to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But, but you're interrupting our service. You see how quiet and, and, and docile we are and boring? Yeah, I see that, man. I got to go find another church. This one ain't the place. I like, I like a lively church, man. I like y'all singing. I like the little choir up here, too, man. That's a great thing. It could get bigger, too. But I tell you what, I done told them if this thing gets bigger, they're going to have to go out and get some people that sit out there while they're singing. You got to replace yourself out there. Don't be coming up here and leaving the pews empty. You better go get somebody else. Why? Because you got to have somebody to sing to. You're going to look stupid up here singing to nobody. Unless we put a mirror, have a drop-down mirror where you can see yourself or something. Get a bouncy ball. We could put a video screen up there. No. That ain't going to happen. Bouncy ball. No. And he goes, and they shall look upon me who they, uh, who they pierce and go to 13.6. Uh, Brother, this is a great day. I, I, this is one of my favorite days of the year because this is the day where I stop and think back what he did for me. And he didn't have to do it, really. I mean, uh, there was no reason on this planet that he had to do what he did. Uh, not for me. I'm like, Lord, you, I sit there, I'm four, I've been in this thing for 43 years, and I still tell him to this day, I told, I remember when I got saved back there, I said, hey, you're going to get the wrong guy. You're going to get somebody who's messed up, and I am not worth shooting. You're, this is a bad deal for you. I, it's a good deal for me, but it's a bad deal for you. Have you ever talked to him like that? I did. I said, it's a bad deal for you, and I'm not worth your time. You know, I told him that the other day. I said, I told you back on that porch a long time ago I was not worth your time. And it's like the Lord said, yeah, but let's go, man. He goes, I can do, he said, if I can take, you know, I was thinking about that day, talking about the roll, stone rolled away from his tomb. He said, when he's coming in Jerusalem, he goes, he goes, if, if you, paraphrase, he said, if you, didn't, if you didn't praise me, the stones would call out. Yeah. I was always wondering if that big old stone that they rolled over his tomb was sitting there saying, Lord, is it time yet? On the inside of the tomb, it wouldn't have been on the outside because they'd been really freaking out out there if it was doing that. But on the inside of that big old rock said, hey, Lord, is it time for me to move out of your way? Can I get out of the way yet? Are you ready? No, 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 no. The two angels said, shh, three days and three nights. Can you not count? There ain't no good Friday. It's three days and three nights. Amen. Amen. Count, count, three. The next day, the stone goes, it's been one. Is it time yet? No, it's not time yet. Boy, that third day, that stone started rolling away, and that rock was probably just screaming and shouting, man. Zechariah 12, 9, Zechariah 13, 6. 13, 6. I just read this through my Bible, man. I said, I got to do something with this thing. I can't let it go. 13, 6. And one shall say unto him, what are the wounds in thy hand? And he shall answer these, those which, which I was wounded in the house of my friends. That's where he got hurt. And you know what we do today? We hurt him. This is, this is his. This is his. It's not ours. It's his. If you're in here today and you gave him some, you even got anything out of the mission or you got anything out of the missionary or the song service or you got anything at all, that's, that's his. He just gave you that. And, and in this house is where he gets hurt. And he wants, to, he wants us to be exactly what we should be for him. But sometimes we just refuse to do that. Today would be a great day to get on the altar up here and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Maybe it's just to sit here and be a family member and just work and do whatever you can do to help support missionaries on the field and help support your local church and the, the ministries of the church. Maybe that's all it is. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe it's just a little bit more than that. But sometimes this world will get in the way and it'll start saying, oh, don't worry about that. You got plenty of time. Well, you don't know if you have plenty of time. It's appointed on a man once to die. You don't know when that day's coming. Tonight, some of you, Miss Linda passed away last week. You don't know that. You don't know when that day's coming. There's no possible way. But you know what you can say is, Lord, what would you have me do? And just wait and see what he says. And if you don't say nothing, just get up and do whatever you're doing. And then just keep saying, Lord, what would you have me do? Today, what would you have me do today? You ought to be, that should, should be your morning prayer. Lord, what would you have me do today? He sits there and says, those, could you imagine those people who were asking this? said, Lord, what are those marks on your hands? He said, I got those in the house, my friend. All of a sudden, you got to say, Lord, was it me? Was it me that put those marks on your hand? 
Was it me that put that crown of thorns on your head? Was it me that put the marks on your feet? Lord, I'm sorry. What can I do to replay? I had preachers tell me before, Mike, you can never do enough to pay Jesus back for what you've done. You're absolutely right, I can't. But boy, I can sure try. Don't you want to try it today? Father, thank you for your blessings today. Lord, for the next couple of minutes, I just pray that some people would just come down and just ask you, ask you, Lord, ask you what you would have them to do. Lord, Brother Anderson gave a, a good me, uh, a message this morning about uh, giving our hearts and our souls to him and, and just whatever you'd have us to do, Lord. It, uh, I'd have been a missionary if you'd have let me, Lord, but you just this is what you told me to do, and this is what I did. Uh, Lord, I'd do it today. Today, Lord, if you told me to leave and, and walk away from here and become a missionary, I'd do it in a heartbeat, Lord. Uh, I'd rather follow you wherever you're at than go somewhere where you're not. Lord, I just pray that you touch our hearts today. Lord, the, the, the service is yours. Lord, this church is yours. Lord, we're yours. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us. And Father, we'll praise you not only in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. While these are praying, we'll go ahead and stand, get your hymnals, and we'll turn to hymn number 221. 221 this morning. <laughs> an opportunity to be in church. Thank you for what we've heard. Lord, I echo pastor. Lord, I don't even know how I got here sometimes. I just don't understand it. But I'm sure thankful that you came and by your grace just was able to touch a life. And I know you're not getting a lot out of that deal. But God, thank you. 
So I pray, Lord, as we leave here this morning on Resurrection Sunday, Father, as we, we thank you and praise you, because without this resurrection, Lord, we're of men most miserable, but this morning we're not miserable, God. We're exceedingly joyful and happy, and we rejoice, Father, in what you have provided for a bunch of Gentile dogs, and we can have something to look forward to in eternity. So we just want to say this morning that we love you. Thank you, Lord, for this service and meeting with us. We don't take it lightly. And Father, we pray that you might bring us back here tonight after whatever time we spend with one another and family and friends this afternoon, that we might hear from you again. We just appreciate your presence, and we ask now you bless us that we go our separate ways and bring us back tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.